folks, Dr. Ross Adele here for the second part of the Gilded Age. We're going to be focusing on the Chicago World's Fair, a microcosm of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, here we go. Yes? No? Maybe. Okay. Uh, the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Uh, the um, yeah, It was supposed to be the uh, celebration of the 400th uh, anniversary of uh, Columbus uh, accidentally uh, tripping uh, his way uh, to this part of the world, because, um, of course, he was trying to find his way to China. Uh, but uh, that would have been 1892, uh, but the guys in charge could not get their act together, so it started one year later in 1893. Hence, it was the 401st uh, anniversary celebration of Columbus accidentally uh, finding his way this way. Uh, I'll be talking about the first, the first of the fair. And the first of the first is the movie. Uh, Thomas Edison uh, from New Jersey uh, created the first uh, in the United States motion picture. Uh, this is his studio in New Jersey. Uh, he was all set to ramp up production afterwards. Um, Going to be a group of guys who will conclude that the warm, sunny Southern California is going to be um, it's going to attract more uh, attention uh, of both people who will produce movies as well as actors. And then say the uh, cold gray uh, New Jersey, um, and uh, those guys will be right. Uh, anyhow, um, he's going to actually produce uh, two uh, movies uh, during uh, the World's Fair. The World's Fair is going to last a year, folks. Okay, uh, the first one is called The Sneeze, and the second one, whoo hoo, is called The Kiss. Are you ready? Okay, uh, he's going to charge people five cents uh, to see these, and so afterwards. Um, uh, folks will um, uh, 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 open up uh, movie theaters that they'll call Nickelodeons. And at Nickel, Nickel, come on, oh. at Nickelodeons, you will pay, what the heck, at Nickelodeons, you will pay five cents uh, to watch these movies. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's go here. Let's go there. The first movie is called The Sneeze. Now, there's no sound, folks, so don't, don't adjust your volume. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov. There we go, folks. The introduction and the commercial for the Library of Congress was a lot longer. Okay, you want to see the next one? Let's close that one. This one is called The Kiss. The Kiss. Ooh, Mary Irwin is the actress. Okay, ready for The Kiss? This one lasts a little bit longer. Look how they get it on. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I should warn you, if you cannot accept this much passion, this much lust, ooh, look away. Here it comes. Wait for it. Talking about it. Close. Okay, I think this is it. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. It is. Visit us at loc.gov. Yep, first two movies. Okay, folks. Now we go back to here. And we go back to whoop, slideshow. Current slide. Well, what do you think? Yep. Uh, the other first was the first pancake in a box kit. It was called Aunt Jemima. Uh, an ex-slave called Nancy Green was the, 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 the physical Aunt Jemima. She wore the costume. Um, there are no known photographs, drawings, renditions of Nancy Green in the costume. This has been on the Internet for as long as the Internet just about existed. This is opposing Nancy Green. There, there, there's, there's no documentation supporting Okay, none whatsoever. Uh, so this may be, this may not be. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Nancy Green, anyhow, portrayed uh, Aunt Jemima from 1893 uh, until 1923. Um, and of course, Aunt Jemima had, has, 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 has changed uh, over the years. Uh, this is Aunt Jemima uh, in the 1940s. This is her in the 1950s. Uh, and then she eventually got a perm uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a perm and pearl earrings uh, in the 1980s. Um, 
Aunt Jemima, however, for, for the vast majority of, 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 of her existence, has taken on uh, the, the slave uh, stereotype uh, of the mammy, okay? The happy-go-lucky, overweight uh, 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 slave um, uh, maid who, who, who works in the kitchen, okay? Who, who makes the food and who is just happy and excited to be around uh, the master and the mistress and the kids. Uh, here's a commercial. Uh, note, uh, note how she speaks. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Wait, first is, oh, sorry. No, no. Uh, here. Is in town, honey. Happy days is here. Uh, time faux delicious Aunt Jemima is made from secret recipe. Ready fixed for you. So clearly, uh, this is someone who does not speak uh, proper English, possibly someone who did not learn English um, uh, sorry, somebody whose English is not her first language, i.e., uh, a slave. Um, so here's a here's a commercial uh, for um, uh, Aunt Jemima, uh, in which the um, uh, obviously uh, Aunt Jemima herself is completely uh, ignored. Mm, Aunt Jemima's so tender, so light. There's something about Aunt Jemima's. Peg, these are terrific. What's the secret? Oh, it's an old family secret, handed down from generation to generation, <laughs> from father to son. By Aunt Jemima. <laughs> the secret is out. Well, I ought to know Aunt Jemima. I was raised on them. Say, and I love the way the sausage is right in the pancake. Isn't it good? And it's so easy. Yes, yeah, simple and delicious. Just fry pieces of bulk pork sausage, shake up a batch of Aunt Jemima's, then pour the batter on the griddle, and sprinkle with drained sausage meat. You know, more people have flipped over Aunt Jemima's than any other pancakes in the world. Light, tender, Aunt Jemima's. If you like pancakes, then sure as shaken, they're Aunt Jemima's. Okay, a couple of things with that. One, why so much sir? If the pancakes taste that good, why is there almost no pancake? It's just permanently syrup. Two, why are they eating pancakes at night? Okay, how about dinner? Three, don't they have a kitchen table? Okay, why are they eating in what appears to be the living room on a little table? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Just some observations there for you. Keeping you on your feet, folks. Anyhow, yeah, uh, uh, Aunt Jemima definitely has uh, her roots in uh, uh, the slave stereotype. Um, the automatic dishwasher has its, oh, I'm sorry, it was about. More, okay, here's some other. The appearance of the pancake in a box mix means a couple of things. One, it means our economy is getting better because um, when you buy stuff in bulk, or when you buy at least a larger quantity of stuff, it is more cheap per ounce than when you buy smaller quantities. When I buy a five-pound bag of flour, that is cheaper per per ounce. And say, when I buy flour, it comes in a smaller box, i.e. In, in a box of Aunt Jemima. And, and, and two, it's cheaper for me to mix the stuff than it is to pay somebody or, or a machine to mix it up for me. Okay. Uh, these, the second thing is that this suggests that life is speeding up. You don't have time, right, to mix flour uh, with baking powder uh, and baking soda and sugar and whatever else that you want to put into your pancakes. Um, right? You need someone to do it for you and then just add a little bit of milk and whatever flavoring you want. And then boom, there you go. Right? He's going to stand there and go shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Um, and, and so that's, 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 that's the significance of, of, of the, the introduction of, of this first uh, pancake in a box mix. Uh, two, uh, or the next, we have a Josephine Cochran's automatic dishwasher. Also, once again, suggesting that you have other stuff to do than to stand there and wash dishes. Also, this could be somebody for somebody who cannot afford a maid or, or someone, you know, to do the cleaning up for you. But maybe you can afford a dishwasher. Um, the, like I said, Josephine Cochran came up with this uh, uh, device and uh, it'll eventually be sold uh, under uh, KitchenAid. Gum. Uh, William Wrigley Jr. Uh, was a candy maker in, uh, in Chicago. And you will develop this, this candy that lasts always. Well, at least the candy will. The flavor, of course, will not. 
Um, he'll come up with two flavors during uh, the one year long uh, fair, uh, juicy fruit and spearmint. He will eventually sell so many sticks of gum uh, that he will be able to purchase uh, a baseball team called the Chicago Cubs and, and, and build a stadium called Wrigley Field. Cereal. We have our first packaged cereal, shredded wheat, uh, made by the National Biscuit Company. Uh, companies try to uh, promote themselves as being national as opposed to regional companies. And so the National Biscuit Company, also known as Nabisco, uh, shredded wheat, um, once again, suggesting that you don't have time in the morning to make a breakfast. Uh, eggs, um, even toast, okay, don't have time for that. Just dump it out, maybe some milk. Look at this, her declaration of independence. The servant problem changes to servant sense. The servant problem is this, there's the... There's not as many, the belief is, there's not as many qualified immigrants to work in your house servants than there had been. Uh, they are not as up to the task as there had been. They're not as qualified. They're not as willing to work as hard as they had been. Uh, and so, I mean, on one hand, you have the idea that these immigrants are taking our jobs. On the other hand, there's this idea that immigrants are lazy. Okay? They're not willing to do the job anymore. So that's what this is. This is the servant problem those immigrants are simply not doing it. So that's fine. Don't worry about it. Hell, we don't need a servant to make a, make breakfast. Just give your kids shred of wheat. Ta -da! The Ferris wheel. Uh, a French guy named Ferris uh, developed the Ferris wheel, a wonderful form of entertainment. Uh, the Ferris wheel at the Chicago Fair was 250 feet in diameter, and it carried 2,160 riders. Talk about uh, some quality time, or at least quantity time, I should say, spent with your extra special friend as it goes around. The vertical file. Yes, a file in which you put paper this way, as opposed to how we used to do it, just on top of each other. And you would say, whoop de doo Well, here's the significance of this. It's a lot easier to find stuff this way, as opposed to picking it all up and trying to look for it. The vertical file was developed as a result of this. The establishment of the University of Chicago, because this guy, John Rockefeller, needed professionalization in his uh, uh, in the administration of his um, endeavors. He needed someone with uh, advanced training in how to maintain a business, and he called for the Masters in Business Administration. So the University of Chicago will offer training and a degree in the Masters of Business Administration. One outcome of that is going to be the vertical file. We got the first international beer contest. Yep, 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 yep. The first international beer contest um, will be uh, held in Chicago, and the award is going to be a blue ribbon. Uh, one of the uh, entries uh, will be a Pabst Malt Extract. Doesn't that sound delicious? Mmm. It's a hot, sunny day, and I just mowed the lawn. I would like a Pabst Malt Extract. Ugh. Well, uh, Pabst Malt Extract, uh, which was established in 1844 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, won the taste test. <laughs> Obviously, it was not a name test. Uh, and, the, and once again, the, um, the, uh, the award was a blue ribbon, so they changed their name to Pabst Blue Ribbon. Uh, here is a, uh, here's a, here's a TV commercial for older TV commercial for Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. When a waitress glides up to your place with a pretty smile upon her face, here's the way to really romance her. Give her that Pabst Blue Ribbon answer. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Smoother, smoother, smoother flavors. Best in sparkle, million flavors. Taste that smoother, smoother flavor. Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Finest beer served anywhere. Prove it yourself. Make the three-way experts test. One, see the clear color. Look at the creamy head. Two, sniff that fragrant Blue Ribbon blend. Three, taste the flavor the whole world knows. And you'll agree... Finest beer served anywhere. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. Yeah. 
And for the past 10 years or so, people have been drinking it uh, ironically. So there we go. Where'd it go? Blah. Uh, look at the ad here, okay? Uh, it's promoting uh, Paps malt extract uh, as a way for women to stay in shape, right? I mean, look at that waist. Good God. So if you drink beer, you look like her. Yeah. Diet soda is also introduced at the 1893 World's Fair. Uh, and diet soda goes hand in hand with what I mentioned earlier about the new woman uh, needing to lose weight, needing to stay in shape. Um, it didn't really take off that well um, because there were other options like, like heroin. I mean, that worked really well. It, it really does. From what I've seen, there are lots of evidence, you know, especially since, you know, the early 2000s, um, which I was, I was kind of interesting. I mean, heroin is, is really a kind of a, kind of a, a 1990s, early, early 2000s thing. So to, to see it, you know, go into into the rural parts of the United States. Uh, it was different. Uh, the other thing that women could take are, are, are tapeworms. You know, you swallow this live thing and it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, that also works. But there's also so, all sorts of goofy things, man. I mean, look at this. Uh, <laughs> advertised, to, you know, chin reducer. You know, the reality is, folks, the older you get, stuff just kind of goes south. Well, hell, man, if, if I would have just got the chin reducer and beautifier, I wouldn't have to worry about this. Man, certainly, goofy stuff like this isn't available anymore. Oh, look at this. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, the neckline slimmer. Yep, look at that. Oh, look at the results. Wow. And she looks happy. Yay for her. Nonsense. Anyhow, uh, diet soda. Uh, the first really successful diet soda in the United States was called Tab. Uh, that came out in the uh, in the late 1950s. Let's see if we can we got a commercial here set up for Tab. Okay. When you can't be with him, mind When you can't be with him, be in his mind. Be a mind sticker with a shape. Can't forget. Don't you want to have a good shape? He wants you with a good shape. Shape with tab. Tab can help you stay in his mind. It's sugar free and it tastes better than any diet cola. Because the Coca Cola Company wouldn't have it any other way. Enjoy tab and be a mind sticker. Mind sticker. <laughs> That's pretty funny stuff. Ah, oh, yeah, just a terrible message. Terrible. Not, not, not that the message for little girls are any are any different today. Hamburgers. Yep, yep, yep. Got the first hamburgers. Hey, everybody lays the claim of inventing hamburgers. Yep, yep, yep. There's a there's a restaurant in Wisconsin that claims to have invented hamburgers. There's a restaurant in Texas that claims to have invented hamburgers. Hell, throw a dart on a map of the United States, and you're going to hit a state in which some restaurant claims to have invented hamburgers. It's a piece of meat between two pieces of bread. Good God, man. I don't think somebody invented hamburgers in 1893. What happened is they became wildly popular in 1893. Um, and McDonald's was not the first uh, uh, national chain to sell Hamburgers. They they certainly were the first one uh, to make it wildly popular. And I, I want you to look at these two commercials. These these are these are two very different um, ways that McDonald's is trying to get uh, people, especially um, young black people, to look at McDonald's. This one in 1992 is known as the Kelvin commercial, and then this one in 2017 is known as the Sebastian commercial. These are 25 years apart. Okay. This one, the, the Calvin commercial, is saying you can go places in McDonald's. This one is saying you can go places because of McDonald's. Okay, look at this one. Uh, committed to being America's best first 
job, meaning work for us and go away. Go do something else. You're not going to stay here forever. This one says you can stay here forever. Wow, I wonder what changed. Let's watch these two. Oops, somehow I turned on Siri. Where are we? Here. Okay, here was the Kelvin commercial. What's up, Jake? What up? Where's Kelvin? At the J-O-B, man. What? He's still flipping those burgers at Mickey D's. Here's your order. Thanks, Kelvin. He's not tired of that yet. Could be kicking it with us, mm -hmm. man. Having big, big fun. He says he has a plan, man. Meet the newest member of our management team. Calvin. Congratulations. All right, right, man. All right, Manager, Calvin, dude. Man. Cool. All right. Yep, I'm part of the management team now, mama. Oh, baby, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I'm with my boy too hard oh. now. Yeah, you're right, because he does wear some fresh clothes. Yo, Calvin. Welcome to the hood. May we help you? <laughs> so, not much. Well, I'm out. <laughs> Hey, yo, yo, Calvin. What's the word on that job thing? Oh, man, you know, not for me. <laughs> or a friend of mine. Right. Okay. So McDonald's is the place that launch your career, that will be your career. 25 years later, they're, 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 there's a reason for this, this major shift, which we'll get to later on. Watch. Fries for 316, please. Thank you. David, what's going on? Oh, hey. That's it? Yeah. Everybody, two Thank seconds. You. Dear Sebastian, after careful consideration of your application, it is with great pleasure that we offer our congratulations on your acceptance. Through the tuition assistance program, every day McDonald's helps more people go to college. It's part of our commitment to being America's best first job. Yeah, McDonald's is going to help you move on. Damn, that's interesting stuff. How did that happen? Get to that. We got the first movable sidewalk. You know that stuff that you stand on when you go to airports where you don't want to use your legs and walk? Yeah. So I guess you can stand there, you know, on the movable sidewalk. And just eat your hamburger and drink your diet soda. And the first serial killer, folks. Holy cow. Uh, his name was Herman Mudgett. He went by a Henry Howard Holmes or H.H. H. Holmes. Um, he, uh, he worked at the World's Fair Hotel. Um, the World's Fair Hotel hired him as a doctor and uh, to work in the mortuary. So, uh, yeah, he was supposed to, to, to heal people, deal with sick people, and then, you know, take care of those who didn't quite make it. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, and, and he lived in, in this really crazy building uh, called the Holmes Castle. Um, it had these trick doors. Um, you go into a door and there'd be a slide, uh, or, 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 or there would be like a, a window that appeared to look outside, but it really didn't. Um, swinging doors, just, just rotating, uh, walls, just all sorts of crazy stuff he had built. In. Um, so it, it took, when the, when the police figured out who he was, it, it took him a while to, to get to the bodies. Um, well, uh, he ran a crematorium at the World's Fair. I mean, people, people could watch him process dead bodies. Um, uh, and there, there were ads appearing in, in, in the Chicago newspapers about uh, the disappearance of, uh, of people. And, and at first it was, it was family members saying, have you seen, you know, my daughter? Have you seen my wife? Have you seen my child? Have you seen my husband? Um, there, there are also ads about by keeping your dogs locked up at night because uh, there were some uh, some some folks who believed that uh, that certain um, uh, foreigners were, were were eating the locals' dogs. But um, uh, this this was of course uh, serious. 
Um, the police eventually identified uh, 27 people who, uh, who this guy killed. Uh, they believe uh, that he killed at least 200. Um, and this is, this is how he said uh, he killed uh, most of them, uh, simply putting him between his legs and snapping their head back. Um, and on May 7, 1896, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, put to death. Um, uh, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, this is, this is going to be the country's first, first uh, serial killer. Uh, well, folks, that's uh, that's it for the big for the first for the first for the first. Here's that uh, that same photo I think I used before about uh, about Jacob Reese. Uh, this is this is it's going to be this time in the Gilded Age that, that that his photos his books will become wildly popular, and it's it's going to be maybe the next lecture or two that we find out. I mean, like I said, this these themes existed. It, it's just that a lot of these photos, like like this one, um, had been staged. Okay, folks, that's all I got for you for now. Uh, so let's uh, let's say our fond adieus. We'll be back and better than ever in a few minutes. Have a good day.